So, Mr. Herzog, thank you for taking the time to talk with us. I know because you said it in your book that you are very aware of your position in space and you are only comfortable talking with someone who is on your right, but just want to check if this is no, okay. It is correct if you sat on the left. Right. I would feel like contorted. I cannot think well if I... Uh, if you were in the wrong position. A, a very strong sense of, of direction and of space. It's a, a certain quality that you have to, even in writing, in your prose, uh, a sense of balance, a sense of orientation. And that's what strikes me in your book as well, because of, in Italy it just came out, Ognuno per sedio contro tutti, and this is not even your first book, you've written a bunch of them, I think they're all incredibly good. And I even heard you say more than once that you think that your books will outlive your movies. Do yes. You, do you still think so? Yes, and uh, you have to uh, see the situation differently now because since more than four decades, I keep speaking to deaf ears that my prose and my poetry has uh, some sort of... Uh, a quality that will outlive my films. I may be wrong, I have been important things, I have been wrong quite often. But um, at the moment I have the feeling my films are uh, a distraction. And I have a simple way to explain it. My films are my voyage, but writing is home. And I've always been a writer from very early on. And um, the films at the moment are more like a distraction. But do you also think that humankind will eventually, I don't know, lose interest in movie as we know them, but will stick to the written word? It could happen. And it could happen that uh, people will not read much or nothing at all in the very far future. And you can see a decline of reading. Uh, and it goes on for 70 years now, slowly, slowly, slowly coming lower. Even university students who should read Uh, like in humanities, they do not read enough. And they cannot articulate uh, a simple thought in five sentences. They cannot do it anymore. And this is why I keep saying to everyone, uh, not only, I say to filmmakers in particular, what should I do as a young aspiring filmmaker? And I tell them, read, 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 read. So, because you will become a filmmaker, but maybe a mediocre at best. But to make real good films, you have to read. And to be a real, real complex and responsible human being, you should read. And, you know, you've been widely known for um, always blurring the line between uh, reality and fiction, between uh, feature films and documentaries. And now I think it's quite ironic that you, yourself, your voice, your way of thinking have become a fictional character in a way. Because in the last years you've been a villain for some TV series, you've been a voice for The Simpson, a voice for Rick and Morty, you've been a, an internet meme in a way. You have a, a thousands of people imitating your voice and your style yes. in YouTube videos. So well, they, they give advice for life yeah. with my voice. Yeah. Of course, it's total forgery. Of course it is. I'm not in social media. Of course. I do not even have a cell phone. Yeah. But in a way, representation of self is dramatically shifting. And you see it uh, in YouTube, you see it on TikTok, the stylizations, the performative character, uh, and you see it uh, on social media. Much of it is a, is a kind of modified form of self. When you represent yourself to the world, uh, of course, it's natural and it's good that you embellish you know, your own self. That's very human and it should be like that. Uh, but in general, since we can reach out everywhere in the world, and since people hear my voice, uh, they start to imitate it. There's something which strangely attracts them. How do you feel about it, about becoming um, a character in the mainstream culture? Well, I have asked myself the same question, of course. What do I do there? Why am I in Simpsons? I can tell you why I am Simpsons. Because I found uh, the Simpsons uh, with a very specific humor, pure anarchy. 
and I did not even know what the Simpsons were. I told them, oh, I, do they speak? Do they really speak? They said they speak since 23 years or so. I thought it was comic strip. It was strips like printed in newspapers. And I asked them, I, the man who founded the Simpsons, I asked him, can you send me a, a DVD with uh, some samples so that I can see how cartoonish the voices are? And he thought I was, I was making a joke and, and I was uh, making fun of him. Now, I really did not know what the Simpsons were. And uh, I immediately understood, yes, this was very significant, a very significant worldview, sheer anarchy of storytelling and characters. And I said, yes, it makes sense. I should be part of it. And talking about your voice, I was wondering, when did you find your voice? Because it seems to me that you kind of always, always had it. If I think from the very first movies to the last one, from, from Sign of Life to Stroshek to Into the Inferno, you name it, you have always been very Zogin. And uh, if I think about other directors, other artists, other writers, uh, I see a path. I see them growing up in public, building up their poetics. But you, it's like you've always been you. And uh, so is that so? And when do you think you find your voice the first time? That's a very complex yeah, I know. sort of thing. But I can simplify it. I wanted to make a film on flying, on the ski flyer. And it uh, is my film, The Great Ecstasy of the Sculpture Steiner, of the greatest ski flyer of ramps, Walter Steiner the Swiss athlete. And um, it was conditio sine qua non mm -hmm. that I, the directors had to be in front of the cameras and speak to the cameras and be uh, the chronicle of events. I hated it. Yeah. But in a way, I realized uh, uh, this was probably my voice that I, should, that I should use as background commentaries. And my voice also... Mm -hmm. Uh, was formed when I hypnotized yeah. an entire cast. All the actors were under hypnosis and I hypnotized them. But they were under hypnosis so deep that they could open their eyes without waking up. And they were hypnotized so deep that they could have conversation, dialogue. And um, there's such a thing as a hypnotic voice with a certain intensity which also informed my voice. But it's, it's not an unnatural voice for me. You, you hear my voice in my writing, yeah. the style of my writing. There's, there's something, it's maybe wrong, but there's something hypnotic about it. At some point in your book, you talk about how you get lost really in Thomas Bernard and uh, because you're shocked by the marvelous incipit of walking. And that was strange because I never made that connection before. Probably it's more of an eye list. I don't think you're... You're, you're a nihilist, uh, and I think this is one of the great uh, misconceptions about your poetics, because I think there is something very profound, very humane, I don't know if spiritual is the word, but uh, yeah, very, very uh, unique in your movies. Uh, desperate, maybe yes, but not nihilist. Yeah. And, uh, but still, there is, I, 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 I've seen that connection for the first time reading your so book. So I feel an affinity to yeah. Thomas Bernhardt. Although his characters in his prose is very different yeah. from mine. Of course, there are affinities. Affinities are, for example, in uh, antiquity, uh, Virgil, but I'm speaking of Georgica, mm -hmm. the Georgics, mm -hmm. not of the Enid. The, the beauty of, of prose, a, a, depth, a depth of, uh, of language that you will never find again. Or... Uh, writers like uh, Rimbaud or Hölderlin um, 200 years back, Rimbaud less than 200 years back, but uh, also prose that you will find in fairly obscure book, The Peregrine by J.A. Baker about he observes peregrines. The book was published in the late 1960s and I kept promoting it, promoting it because it's such incredibly beautiful prose such intensity of prose and uh, of course uh, in a way uh, some guidances uh, it's everywhere there are guidances out for me and uh, or for example when you look at um, Joseph Conrad in his uh, short stories speak of the short stories 
in his short stories, there's not much of an event, uh, like in Typhoon. It's just waiting for the Typhoon to arrive, or um, others, an outpost of progress, or um, part of darkness. Yes, a mysterious character out there in the jungle, mm -hmm. but not much of a, of a story, but it's a caliber, the caliber of the prose. And the caliber of the prose comes because there's a worldview, yeah. experiences in the world, in the worldview that makes a certain style, a certain language necessary. And it's exactly like that with me, the, the, the intensity of life, the intensity of a worldview comes across in form of language, in form of, of prose. And this intensity, I think, uh, will make this, my prose, outlive my films. You see, I, I would start to write a book when, when I have it all in me. That's yeah. why it's easy to uh, quite fast you, to you write it fast, down. Yeah. Even this no, book was fast driving? Yes, all yes right. sure. I wrote it right after Il Crepusculo del Mondo. Right. Uh, and a few days later, I continued writing oh. and it went very fast because You see, uh, this book was in me. This book was in me for tw more than 20 years. I could have written it 15 years ago or 10 years ago, but it was somehow in me. And because of that, fast in writing it down. My memoirs, well, that's my life in me for 80 years now. Of course, uh, you have to look back at yourself, which I do not like that much, but of and course- you don't you like introspection. I right. don't like it too much and I'm careful about introspection to some degree, but it's also uh, not bad to look back and to evaluate a little bit. And of course, memoir, memories or memoirs can be deceptive. Um, and I pointed out sometimes I had a conflict around my first great love in my uh, young life. I had a conflict with a family of her and they were... When I came to them, they announced they would kill me. And my girlfriend had four brothers, all strong Bavarian ice hockey players. And I mentioned maybe my memory makes the adversary too big. Maybe it was not four brothers, but maybe only three. I think today now, looking more and more into it, I think I'm exaggerating, thinking it was four. It was actually probably only three. So, and I mentioned it, my memory may deceive me. My memory may make the enemy bigger than it was because there's no, uh, there's no uh, truth in memory. You deal also with the present in your book because uh, it's very wide ranging and uh, you take a stand against uh, consumerism yeah. and of course we will have to change our habits if we, if we want to survive in this planet and change will be painful I think. No and it will not be painful. All right. No you'd better look at your you manage your fridge in America 45% of food is being thrown away. Yeah. It doesn't happen with me when I uh, when I eat something I really clean my plate I eat what I order and I look after the maintenance of my fridge. Yes, it happens that I forgot a salad in a corner and, uh, and I have to throw it away, but maybe only 2%, not 40%. And how much energy we would save by not raising the cattle and water and then slaughtering them and then deep freezing them and then driving to the supermarket and buying the packaged Uh, meat in plastic if you were only attentive but you know you just live in LA which is one of the more consumeristic city maybe in the one of the most consumeristic country in the world but you still love LA right yes because it's a city with the most substance probably in the world and you don't have to think about the glitz and glamour of Hollywood yes it is it is there and you have to take it seriously because it articulates the collective dreams of the world if you go to the philippines i want to see a hollywood action movie or they want to see a fantasy film the same thing in uruguay and the same thing in south korea and on and on i do not uh, i'm not part of that i make different kind of films but um, a part of that almost everything of great importance for the world 
originated from Los Angeles, like, for example, the internet. It was born in Los Angeles, like I keep saying, the reusable rockets, that we are not shooting a rocket like NASA and it uh, burns up in the atmosphere. There is a factory, SpaceX, by Elon Musk, which uh, builds rockets that you can use again. They come back down on parachutes, land exactly, and you use them again. And it's a very good idea. And it makes it less expensive, less consumerism in that. Many other things. Also, the great painters, they are not in Florence or in Milano, they are in, in Los Angeles. And also, also the crazy things like crazy sects, crazy things like yoga classes for five-year-olds. Yeah. So it's a whole spectrum. All right. But it's good to live in a city where things really get done, where all the great ideas originate and are being put into practice. So you, you don't feel like an alien there? Yeah, well, that's a difficult question. <laughs> it's not my culture. It's not my language. It's not my attitude towards consumerism. It is not my political landscape. Uh, many other things. Uh, It's a country that still has capital punishment. That's why I do not become an American citizen. And that's why I cannot become a Saudi Arabian or a Chinese or a Pakistani or Egyptian or Indonesian or you just name it. I'm not an alien, but um, I'm in a city uh, that has vibrant, vibrant culture. And it's not only American culture, it's the influx of Mexico, 40% or 35% are Mexicans now. They bring their music, their poetry, their raps. There's a wonderful energy just coming from Mexico. And it's good to live like, like that. It's, it was good uh, five centuries ago to live in Rome yeah. or in uh, Firenze. Or in, so, yes, fine, but that was the time of it. Today it should be Los Angeles or maybe alternative Shanghai. In your books and in your movies, you have a strong view of nature as not romantic at all, yeah. as hostile, unaware, uncaring, indifferent. And you, and still you love nature, as you said in Burden of Dream by Les Blanc, you say you love it against your better judgment. Yes. And I always wonder how, as deep as we are in the climate crisis, we can find Uh, a way to defend uh, something that we are afraid of in, a, in this very deep and primordial way, because we are humans because we got out of nature. And now we have to like, find a way to defend it and to defend the whole planet in it. Is this something we are even able to do as a species? Well, we are confronted uh, with, uh, with a crisis. Uh, it's undeniably there. And the crisis has, uh, at its deepest origin, the amount of people that we have living here on this planet. It's too many. Planet, the resources of the planet uh, cannot sustain it for long like this. So uh, the question, how do we... We cannot really reduce the amount of, of human beings. We may be reduced through a very serious pandemic, for example, or through a nuclear war, or you, a meteorite impact, but a massive one. But, but it, it, it is a source of all problems, and that's a problem of the 20th century. And the second element that makes a crisis really, really deep is consumerism, that almost the entire world Even the emerging world, the third world, is lapsing into an attitude of consumerism. And of course, that's something we can regulate. We can, if we are intelligent, we can, we can do it easily. For example, uh, I have only one pair of shoes, the shoes that you see. And I wore my shoes, they are pretty new. I wore my last shoes for five years and then they were really worn out. So I bought one pair of shoes. Even for walking, as you do? No, I am not completely correct. All right. I have a pair of boots for, for mountains, I mean for rock, uh, and I have a pair of sandals for when I'm out in hot climate. So it, I'm, I'm not telling the full truth, but essentially, essentially I'm wearing 
95% of my time I wear one pair of shoes. Listen, in, in the many ways you described yourself over the years, and I'm taking this out of context, so it might yeah. sound weird, but you described yourself as a poet, of course, as a man from medieval times, as a soldier once, as a clinically sane person that was at the Berlin International Film Festival. Yeah. It was the headline was, Herzog, I am a sane person, I don't yeah. know why. Because people said, yeah, you must be insane, no. Yeah. I'm the only one in this prof profession who is clinically sane. And I agree with that. And, and an athlete as well. Yeah. And you said your role model for being an athlete uh, of filmmaking was Franco Baresi. Why Baresi? Ah, why him? Yeah. Well, uh, well, he's a wonderful character, number one, a great human being. And I saw him at Torino Book Fair. Oh, you met him? And, yes, I finally met him. It was fine because I, I spoke about him and he read in the newspaper that I speak so highly of him and he was seeking contact. And he contacted me and I said, we have to meet and we should go to your village where you came from and we have to eat your bread and salt and vino di uva <laughs> from what, you, uh, what your people are doing there. And we still have not, not done that, but I love him for his qualities, human qualities. He's a true, true captain. And there were a thousand people in the auditorium at Tur Torino Book Fair and he would sign books. And when he stepped on the podium, all of a sudden, intellectuals, young kids, everybody shouted, Viva il Capitano. He a, has a leadership and he earns it. And secondly, I love players, athletes, like in football, who can read the game. They understand the dynamics of the movement of the opponent. And as a soccer player, fifth, sixth division or so, I was a little bit like him. Everyone in my team was technically better. Everyone in my team was faster, but I was center forward and I would always score more goals than the others because I understood where I had to be. Are you writing something new? Uh, well, after this book, I immediately wrote yet another book, which is finished and will be published in its German original in spring next spring and it has a, a, a very fine title the future of truth oh, okay so you may see it <laughs> maybe at feltrinelli um, they haven't seen it yet oh. it's wild storytelling but it's also about uh, my encounters with uh, truth and my concept of truth and facts and reality so um, it's a wild book and uh, you will eventually see it. I, I, I'm looking forward to it. It's been the greatest pleasure, Mr. Isaac, to meet you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Lucy.